Well, losing your home in a bushfire is something no family should have to contemplate. Watching it burn down right in front of you is almost unfathomable. But that's exactly what Adam Schweinsberg had to do. Like so many others here, Adam knew the risks and he had his bushfire plan. But when the fire raced over this hill that you can see just behind me, he barely even had time to plug in his hose. At what point did, in your mind, did you realise that you couldn't save the house? The point I realised when I couldn't save it is when I went to my my pump, my water pump, uh, and it was it was under a whole bunch of stuff in the shed. Didn't have enough fuel in it. The fire brigade didn't have enough pressure in their hoses. Uh, by the time I got one of their water pumps down with their hoses to hose the actual flames, it was it had already spread to the middle of the house, and no amount of water was going to stop that. It was it was finished. We were trying to do what we could to, you know, stem the flames. But, you know, we were fighting a losing battle. We decided we are just wasting water. So turned off the pumps and just stood back and I thought I might get some documentation. Just... A difficult decision to make, though. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Oh, the last room I was trying to save was the laundry down there. Nothing, the, nothing had burnt through. The, the roof was still on it, the sides were still OK, because I had a fish tank in there with some, some really nice fish, which I would have liked to save. So I was spraying the hose through, in, through the window into the, the laundry, and I was wetting down the, uh, the uh, other wall on that side and going through the kitchen window, wetting down the wall on this side, just to try to save that room with the big fire hose, plenty of water getting in there. but. It was always, it was, it was always going to be a, a losing battle. And so you stood back and just, did you watch the house cave in on itself? Uh, at that point, at that point, I um, I got a call from my mum who was up on Hawkesbury Road up here, and she's not feeling well, as as you can imagine, she was getting some chest pains. I think really stressed out from the whole the whole ordeal. So I. I drove her down to the hospital. I had to go uh, down to Nepean Hospital. I had to go through Richmond and then up the Northern Road because all the roads down there are blocked. And uh, then I came straight back here again. But by the time I got back to Winmalee, uh, got back to sorry um, Hawkesbury Road, the, the police had blocked that off, and they weren't even letting any any people walk through. So I had to I just had to sit out the roadblock for probably another four hours. And I, maybe even five hours. But, and then when I got back here, it's exactly how you see it, just a little, you know, smouldering bits here and there. What sorts of valuables have you lost? What are the things that you will most miss? Gosh. Well, I do, do, did like my motorbike, but, uh, <laughs> oh, you know, I just, we just renovated the kitchen. It was a pretty amazing kitchen. Um, yeah, just, oh, all my personal possessions that I've been collecting over, the, over the, my, my whole life, you know, everything was in here. Just completely refurbished the lounge room with a, with a full new um, home theatre system. So, yeah, I only had that for six months. Terrible shame. Did you have time to save things? I mean, it, it must have been quite difficult to decide where to go first. It was, yeah. I, I came through the sliding door here. Uh, I was actually looking for my keys for the, for the motorbike and I... Um, they were on those bricks just there, because uh, between the two staircases, I, I, I couldn't see anything, I couldn't breathe. It was just so thick with smoke. So I'm fumbling around, fumbling around for the keys. Uh, I found the, the laptop computer, so I grabbed that and took it out instead. But you plan to come back, or does this make uh, you rethink the environment that you live in? Yeah, it's, it's always going to be risky living here. We've known that forever. I do plan on coming back, of course, but uh, the house, the new house, will be definitely much more. Uh, you know, it'll, it'll have a lot of um, fail subs built into it, like sprinklers and uh, fire fireproof materials. So it should be a lot safer. Well, I'm joined now by someone who knows these communities better than most. The mayor of the Blue Mountains, Mark Greenhill. Mark, such extraordinary destruction here we're seeing. Yeah, it's been uh, an incredibly destructive fire. We've seen fires before in the Blue Mountains, but nothing like this for a very long time. You'd have to go back decades to have experienced a fire as ferocious and as quick as this one. People have been, the ones I've seen walking around today, looking like they're somewhat in disbelief. Yeah, look, there's shock. I spent all of last night uh, in the evacuation shelter with people who lost their homes, and there was absolute shock and disbelief. You know, you lose everything, it's gone in, in minutes. 
but this is a very resilient community. Um, these people will be back. They are not alone. They're supported. They don't stand alone. Our community stands with them and we will be back. What is the one thing they're telling you about these fires? just how quick and ferocious they were, just how extreme these fires were. People, as you said before, and people who had fire plans that just couldn't cope with the intensity of the fire that came up over these ridges. Um, this has been an incredibly intense, rapid fire. Wind conditions, dry ground, all these awful conditions came together at once to create an almost perfect storm. And sadly, it was a perfect firestorm. And it may not be over for a few days yet. It's not, it's not, Jeremy. There's a long way to go and people should stop, listen to the alerts and follow the instruction the emergency services give them. Mark Greenhill, best of luck. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy.